Well, as we have fully swung into the Christmas season, I'm just kind of wondering how you're feeling and whether you have uh, felt the pace of your life accelerating at all. I mean, have you noticed any additional anxiety or, or stress, or does it seem that there's more to do in a day and less time to do it? Because it seems that's what usually happens for us at Christmas. You know, it seems that we usually live our lives so stretched thin, you could see through them, that there's like zero margin in our lives, really. But then we get to Christmas and we kind of accelerate that accelerated pace. So for if normal life like January through November could be categorized as like a Mach 2, then Christmas, we kind of try to take it up to like Mach 5. Parties. Shopping, baking, cooking, traveling, letter writing, card sending, Christmas caroling, here we go a wassailing, bah humbugging. I mean, you name it, we do it during Christmas. And you add all this to lives that are already stretched so thin, and most of us get to the point where you almost break. I know I could resonate. And today, as we begin the Christmas season, I thought it would be appropriate for us to kind of set the tone for this season with a teaching of Jesus that most of us don't associate with the Christmas holiday. And the teaching is found in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn there. But there is no manger filled with hay in this passage. No uh, shepherds guarding their flocks by night. There are uh, no um, angel choirs We won't be reading about any kings from afar bearing gifts or stars shining in the sky. But I think you'll agree that this passage is perhaps the most appropriate Christmas passage for our time. And it's found in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. An interesting account in the life of Jesus, one that we can relate well with because it sounds very much like our world. Maybe it sounds like something you experienced just a few weeks ago on Thanksgiving with all of the ladies in the kitchen, and they're baking and cooking and slicing and wiping and cleaning. They're worried and distracted by many things. And the men are all in, sitting on the couch, listening to the words of Dan Deerdorf as they watch football focused on the one thing. You get the idea. This is a story we might call the tale of two sisters. As Jesus is traveling with his disciples from one place to the next, they come to the town of Bethlehem, or excuse me, of Bethany. And and there, Martha opens her home to Jesus, and she wants to show hospitality to Jesus and his disciples. She wants to prepare a nice meal for Jesus and his disciples. And perhaps she envisions she and her sister Mary working alongside of one another in the kitchen together, you know, bonding time, sister bonding time. And maybe that's even the way it started. But at some point, Jesus starts teaching in the living room. And Mary kind of drifts from the kitchen and finds herself at her master's feet listening to what he has to say. And Martha remains busily working in the kitchen, taking care of the details of the meal. So Jesus is in the living room teaching, and Martha is in the kitchen working. We don't know exactly when it happened or or why it happened or what was happening in Martha's heart exactly, but something happened in Martha's heart that kind of put her over the edge. And she is angry, and she is bitter, and she resents her sister 
sitting in there doing nothing at the feet of her Lord while Martha is doing all of the work. And, and you get the sense that Martha might be a little resentful of Jesus too for Jesus allowing Mary to sit there at his feet. And she can't take any more, and so she goes to Jesus and she says in exasperation, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left all of the work for me to do? And I, I kind of get the sense that Martha expects Jesus to look around, come to his senses, be like, oh wow, I totally missed that. You're right, I am so sorry. Stop the teaching, everybody, Mary, everybody into the kitchen. Let's help Martha. She's stressed out. we got to cook the meal. There's more important things to do here. But that's not how Jesus responds. I love the way Jesus responds. Martha, Martha. You just kind of get the sense he's shaking his head, and he's kind of smiling, and he's looking at his exasperated but beloved friend and daughter, you are worried and upset about many things. But only one thing is needed. Do those words not do something to your heart? At this time of year particularly, just drink those words in. You are worried and upset about many things. But only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the better thing, and it will not be taken from her. A tale of two sisters, Mary and Martha. Two well-meaning but very different sisters. And I want to unpack the passage a little bit in the context of Christmas. But first, let me just kind of ask you, are there any Marys in the house? You know, you, you know you're a Mary um, when you, know, you just don't get upset about stuff. You know, you're kind of laid back. Nothing seems to fluster you. You could sit in quiet contemplation at the feet of Jesus for hours and be completely content that you don't live by lists and things to do. You don't get your identity from what you get done. You can just be. Are there any Marys in the house? Okay, I knew it would be the significant minority, but I mean, it was like six. Are, are there some Marys here that are just afraid to admit you're Mary? It's okay. it's okay. I mean, we don't understand you, but it's okay. The rest of us don't get how you work or how you operate, but you can raise your hand in church. We won't, we won't laugh or anything. No, that's, I mean, yeah, Mary's, we don't get you, but that's awesome. But now, are there any Marthas in the house? Yeah, yeah. Pretty much most of us are Marthas. Um, we're driven people, we're busy, we get stressed, we quickly become resentful when others are just kind of sitting around doing nothing, we're keeping score all the time, we want things to be fair, we live by lists, we like getting things done, crossing things off of our lists, and you know, when I'm working hard and it appears that people are slacking off around me, I notice, <laughs> because I am a Martha. This week I was uh, serving at our uh, community food bank, a wonderful organization, the Parker Task Force, um, helps about 500 families, right, our active clients in Parker right now, uh, at, at that uh, community. Um, wonderful. It's more than a food bank. We pay people's bills, make sure uh, utilities don't get shut off. We pay people's rent and mortgage. I mean, it's a really great organization. I'm an interviewer. So what I do is when people come in, a client comes in, they sit down with me and I just kind of check in with them, make sure that they're doing everything that they need to do in order to kind of get out of their crisis. I pay their bills for them if they, they have a shutoff notice or something. You know, it's just a great interaction with folks. And usually there's two or three interviewers on a shift. And so it's all very equitable. I mean, you get a client, I get a client. You get a client, I get a client. You know, and you know, sometimes if you're somewhat driven, you keep track of who's doing more or whatever. But... <laughs> So this week, we hit this really busy time, and um, I mean, they're just bringing them to me, and I, I mean, the, the clients are just coming, and files are starting to pile up on my desk, and besides this, I'm training a new interviewer, I'm trying to, you know, kind of get her up to speed, when all of a sudden I realize I've seen like six clients, and the interviewer next to me is still on the very first person she started working with, and, and that's when Martha starts to kick in, and I'm like, let's pick it up over there. I mean, do I have to do all the work around here by myself? I mean, Lord, tell her to do her share. 
Well, later when it slowed down and I was talking to the interviewer, I found out the person she was actually interviewing was a, a victim of the Aurora theater shooting and needed extra hand-holding and counseling. And that's what, that's what usually happens to us Marthas, you see. We kind of get all indignant, and then something comes along to bring us perspective and make us feel like this big, and we're like, oh, man. I felt, oh, I, okay, I'm so glad I didn't say anything. I was like, oh, my word. And that's exactly what happens for Martha. She gets perspective. Jesus comes along and he says to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. So let's break down the Martha syndrome. First, let me speak a word in defense of Martha, being one. I think that Martha gets a bad rap. Over the last 2,000 years, I mean, Martha has been made a villain. And come on, this is just not fair. I mean, let's put things in perspective. This isn't the story of the good sister and the bad sister. I mean, it's not like Mary is an angel and Martha is the devil. That's not what this, I mean, the point of the story is not going to be, if you're thinking, if you've heard this message before Christmas maybe, and you've heard, you know, we need to go out and do nothing at Christmas. We, we just need to stop shopping and we need to like, Say no to all the parties and no to all the activity. We just need to sit at the feet of Jesus all day long and we need to sing Christmas carols and we need to do things with our kids all the time and stop all the other stuff and don't wrap presents and please stop making cookies. I mean, we just need to stop at Christmas. That's not the point of the message. It wasn't Martha's busyness that was the problem. She wasn't doing anything wrong. Jesus didn't say, Mary has chosen the good thing and you chose the bad thing. Shame on you. No, he said, Mary has chosen the better thing. There's a big difference. You see, Martha chose some really good things. She opened her home to Jesus and wanted to show him hospitality. That's great. Martha chose a really good thing in that she wanted to create a, a wonderful meal experience for Jesus and his disciples. Again, fantastic. But the problem came for Martha when, according to verse 40, she got distracted by all those good things to the point that she missed the best thing. These words the passage uses certainly describe many of our lives during the Christmas season. Distracted, worried, upset about many things. And, and, and the angel who came that first Christmas and announced to the shepherds what was about to happen at Christmas said, I bring you good news for all people. And so Christmas is supposed to be this time of good news and celebration. But if we look around us at Christmas, and truth be told, if we look inside at Christmas, so often that is not the case for us. It is not good news because we are distracted because we are worried and upset about many things, because we miss the one thing, the best thing. This week at the Christmas store, I, I, I was kind of in the parent area. That was my domain. And so I would kind of sit with the parents as the kids were shopping. I would kind of sit with the parents, try to make, give them a comfortable environment, interact with them as they liked, and had some great conversations with parents on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And I remember on Sunday afternoon, there's one mother in particular, and somehow we got on the conversation of, of Santa Claus. She brought up Santa Claus, and, and with a tear in her eyes, she began to say, how did he become the symbol of this holiday? And marketing, and commercialism, and all of the material things. She said, my kids, they want these things, and they want these special jeans because their friends wear them, and they want the phone that they see advertised uh, uh, in, in all of the commercials. And this is what they think Christmas is about. And I can't give that to them. But I can give them Jesus. And I want to give them Jesus. But they want all these other things. And she says people get so distracted this time of year and she starts crying. People get so distracted they get depressed. And they, 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 they even take their own lives. And she said all I keep telling my children is Christmas is about Jesus. And she's looking at me like, am I crazy? Did I miss something? And I was just able to put my hand on her shoulder and look deep in her eyes and say, Mama, you are not crazy. You are giving your children exactly what they need. See, this woman was a woman with a merry heart, but she had Martha kids. You know what I'm saying? 
She had a merry heart, but her kids were a bunch of Marthas, distracted and worried about many things. And, and, and again, that's where many of us find ourselves. We want to stay focused on the one thing during the Christmas season, but we just kind of get sucked in. Right? We just kind of get sucked in by our culture. We get sucked in by other people. We get sucked in by our own, our own sinful hearts. And none of us intend to spend too much or overbook our schedule or to go into debt or lose our cool at the checkout line. We don't intend to do those things. None of us want to feel the tension or the anxiety of overbooking or being stretched too thin. None of us want to get resentful at yet another appointment. None of us want to blow up at our kids or make it all about the gifts, or feel disappointed when we don't get what we want. That's not the person we, any of us want to be. We don't have to intend those things, but again, we get sucked in to the Martha syndrome. Worry. Upset about many things. Distracted. Can anybody resonate with what I'm saying? So what do we do? What does Jesus say to Martha? What truth does he speak into her life? Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset by many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. So what is Jesus saying, and what isn't he saying? Again, is he saying that Martha shouldn't have had all these people over to her house? That she overcommitted? Is he saying that she shouldn't have cooked the great meal? Is, is he saying that Mary shouldn't have been, or Martha shouldn't have been active and, and, and busy? Again, I don't think so. Um, we often come away, again, with the story, with the idea that activity is bad. But if activity was bad, and busyness is bad, and, and it can be, certainly, but Jesus was like the busiest guy who ever lived. And he never sinned. I mean, it says that Jesus and his disciples at times were so busy that they couldn't even find time to eat, like, all day. That's how busy they were. And so if, if Jesus is condemning Martha for being busy, that might be a bit hypocritical. I don't think that's what he's doing because Jesus didn't like hypocrites. Martha was doing good things. That wasn't the problem. The problem was her heart was out of alignment, right? So why was her heart out of alignment? So if we could just get down to the, the, the make this as simple as possible and get down to the, the, the very common denominator, I think this, this gets at the heart of Martha's issue as well as ours. Martha's heart was out of alignment because Jesus was speaking Jesus was present, but Martha was missing it. Jesus was present in her house, God incarnate, teaching words that bring life, and Martha was in the kitchen missing it. Jesus is speaking in the next room, and there's Mary at his feet listening. And where was Martha? While Jesus is speaking, she is in the next room and she's worried about preparation and getting everything just perfect. Where did Martha want to be? I think she wanted to be with her sister, sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening. That's where her heart told her to go. That's where she wanted to be. Mary made the choice to go there. Martha was resentful. She didn't make that same choice. She didn't go where she wanted to be. She stayed with the preparations. She was distracted. She was worried and upset about many things. Martha knew she had that choice between kind of getting the meal done or putting everything down and going and sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she made a choice to focus on meal preparation. And because she would rather have been where Mary was, she grew resentful of Mary. And she went to Jesus to tell him to get her sister in the kitchen. If she was going to miss Jesus' teaching, so was her sister. But, but here's the thing about Mary. You know, so Martha, we get this picture of this woman, all she does is she's active and she's overstressed and she never connects with Jesus, okay? We villainize her. But then we like kind of make Mary a saint, like she lives her whole life at the feet of Jesus, you know? But I don't get that sense as I read about Mary through the rest of the Gospels. Mary had a life not sitting at the feet of Jesus. She was always connected to him, but she got things done. She had a job. She worked. She would do the dusting. She would do the laundry. She could cook with the best of them. But Mary wasn't lazy. And we need to understand that. If, if this was an issue of Mary being lazy, I don't want to help her out. You know, I just want to sit here all day long and do nothing. I mean, Jesus also would have had something to say about that as well. But Mary knew that when Jesus was speaking... 
It was time to stop working and preparing. And it was time to start listening. Something more important is happening here. The Son of God has something to say. I mean, the Messiah is getting ready to teach. The creator of the universe is in my living room, and he wants to communicate with me. That's pretty awesome. That's more important than getting the meal just right. And so I'm going to stop everything right now, and I'm going to put everything down, and I'm going to, I'm going to still myself so I don't miss a word. Now is the time to stop. You see, both sisters had a choice to make. Continue to prepare or stop and listen to the Lord. Martha made her choice. And Martha's choice led to anxiety and worry and stress and resentment. Mary made, made her choice, which led to communion with Jesus. So the point of the story isn't activity is sin. Stop doing stuff. Stop being busy. Stop going to parties. Stop baking cookies. The point of the story is don't be distracted by good things so that you miss the one thing, the best thing. The best thing, the one thing that Jesus spoke of is clearly his presence, that he was there. He was in the house. And this is the essence of Christmas. Jesus is here. Emmanuel, God is with us. And in the midst of her activity, what Martha needed was to stay focused on the fact that Jesus is in my house. He is present. God was in her living room. And instead of focusing on his presence, she focused on the preparations of the meal. And listen, we're no different. At Christmas, as with any time of the year, we can get so caught up in doing the right things, into doing good things, but have the wrong heart. In doing the right thing, we can miss the presence of Jesus. Again, uh, this week I had a meeting up at our conference office in Denver. I had arranged to get together with another church. I thought it might be good this year to maybe collaborate with another church on the planning of our Christmas service. You know, two are better than one, and then we could mutually do some things, share some elements. Two churches would benefit, and, you know, would make Jesus happy in the process. He prayed that we would be unified, and so we were going to meet, and we were going to plan for a Christmas service, and so we needed a place to meet, and so I called our conference office in Denver, asked if they had a conference room we could use, a whiteboard, everything we would need. We reserved it all. We had it all set. We set our time to meet. We all showed up at this, uh, this, the, the conference office, and we're getting ready to work, and we walk into this conference room. We're ready to go. We're ready to pray. We're ready to be creative. We're ready to plan a, a heart-tugging service that will you know, represent well baby Jesus. And we walk in, and here are two people in this huge conference room, and they're working. And so we're all surprised to see each other. And uh, I'm like, oh, hey, you know, um, what are you doing here? We, we reserved the conference room, and oh, I'm sorry, there must be a mistake, blah, blah, blah. So I went up to the woman who reserved the conference room, and she said, no, 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 it's yours. I mean, no, it shouldn't be anybody down there. So she came down, and she told everybody, you know, these other two people, hey, I'm sorry, these folks have reserved the conference room, and so sorry. And then she left, but our conference room squatters wouldn't go anywhere. They just, they just continued to sit there. And so, you know, we talked, and, 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 and so he said, well, you know, we really need to work here. Is it okay if, if we're really quiet? Can we just stay? And then you guys just kind of do your work. And I'm just like, oh. you know, we're going to be throwing around these stupid, crazy, you know, when you get creative, I mean, you have to be like really stupid and everything. And so, all right, fine. Just be quiet. All right. And so we kind of go over to our little corner of the conference room by the whiteboard, and we're getting settled in, and we're getting ready to start creating, you know, wonderful things for Jesus for his birthday. And then this guy comes over, and he says, you know what? As I think about it, we're really going to need all the conference room by the time we're done here. And so I found there, outside there's a, a, a corner in the hallway. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to, to meet there. I found a whiteboard for you and everything. Would you just kind of go and, and meet over there? And, you know, okay. So I'm thinking to myself that I, I'm a little bit more than put out now. I'm a little irritated by this, but you know, we had reserved the room. We had a right to the room. And besides, we were going to be doing some really good work in this room, planning a celebration for baby Jesus that would warm people's hearts. What do you think you are doing trying to kick us out of the conference room that we reserved to plan this awesome birthday celebration? Do you sense any irony here? I didn't. 
Not at first. And so I acted in a way that wasn't angry, uh, but was tense. <laughs> it wasn't hostile, but I was obviously put out. All right. So we eventually moved to the corner of the hallway, and we had our creative planning time, and the ladies all shivered and froze. And it was a few hours later that I realized that I had been doing good things, but with the wrong heart. I had completely missed the presence of Jesus in the planning of this Christmas celebration. And, and the next day I called and I, I, I called the guy who had been in the conference room and I apologized for being tense and somewhat put out. So don't judge me, okay? Because you guys do the same thing every Christmas. You intend to have this spiritual season where you put the Christ back into Christmas and you avoid all the hubbub and all the distractions. And you're going to... You know, worship the baby born in Bethlehem. But every year you say, that's what's going to happen. And every year we all get sucked in to doing good things and missing the presence of Jesus while we do those good things. We need to learn this lesson. If the devil can't destroy us with bad things, and that works for some of us, some of us, he could just destroy us with bad things, addictions, and all, all kinds of really bad things. And that's where he'll start. But if he can't destroy us with bad things, then he will distract us with good things so that we miss the best thing. And so I'm wondering if we can make a declaration here today. Would you make a declaration with me as we begin this Christmas season? I know we're not going to be perfect. I've already blown it today, all right? We're not going to be perfect, and we're going to miss opportunities, but can we make this declaration today and actually declare it that this Christmas, I will not let the good things distract me from the one thing, okay? Can we actually say that together? This Christmas, I will not let the good things distract me from the one thing. So I think we could all raise our hands and say, I agree with that. I want that. This is the experience I want. I don't want the good things to distract me from the one thing. I want Christmas to be about Jesus. But saying it in your head and then going and living out are two different things, and we all know that. We've all had good intentions to do great things before, and we've missed the mark. So I just want to give you two things today that you, you could kind of put into action that will give you an opportunity to take this good intention and make it actually a part of your life, okay? And this isn't rocket science I'm going to share with you. These are things I'm telling you to do all the time. I told you to do these things last week, and it's going to sound really familiar. And a lot of us raised our hands last week, and we said, you know what, yeah, I'm going to connect to Jesus on Monday. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then Monday came, and you didn't. But there is grace again this week that Jesus says, I'm still waiting. And so the very first thing I would say we need to do if we're going to keep the Christ in Christmas and not get distracted by the, the, the many things is that we need to have times like Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Right? We can't live our lives there. We have work to do and we have things to do and parties to go to and cookies to bake. I mean, we can't live our lives at the feet of Jesus, but we need to have some time at the feet of Jesus, sitting there, listening to him. I have to be intentional about focusing on the presence of Christ in my life. I have to cut out time to just create space in my life where he could speak, where I could speak, where we can interact, where I could be reminded again of who he is and who I am and the relationship that we have. And this is going to look different for all of us. And if you're not doing anything right now to sit at the feet of Jesus, I would just say start here. Tonight, tomorrow night, just go to bed 10 to 15 minutes earlier. Wake up in the morning 10 to 15 minutes earlier and just get somewhere quiet and just spend 10 or 15 minutes in quiet contemplation of who Christ is. If, if you have no, nothing you're doing right now, just start in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Just start there. It's a Christmas story. How appropriate will that be? And you don't have to read the whole book. You don't have to read a whole chapter. Just read a couple passages. Listen for what God is saying to you through his word. And, and when you get to the end of reading for maybe five minutes or whatever, just reflect. What did this just tell me about who God is? God, what, what, are you, what are you saying about who I am? What are you asking of me? What are you telling me about how you feel about me? And, and 
then, then just pray. Interact with God. Spend some time. Bring him your needs. Tell him what, 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 what's on your heart. Tell him about how you're worried and how about you lost your cool yesterday and how you need to talk to that person or where you're going later this day and that he would kind of allow you to be his presence in that, that party or that place or where, wherever you're going. Just talk to him. It's 10 or 15 minutes. And if you're already meeting for 10 or 15 minutes or 30 minutes, then up that. Go deeper. Can't live all our lives there, but we need to spend some of our lives at the feet of Jesus. And, and what's going to happen as you do that? It may not happen the first day. It may not happen the fifth day. But as you regularly cut out time to sit at his feet, you are going to be reminded of how amazingly beautiful he is. He's going to begin to speak into your life that he loves you, that he is for you, that he is working for you, that he has been guarding you, watching out for you, that he has plans for you. It's going to begin to speak truth into your life. You're going to find new perspective. And you're going to begin to see the world in a different way. This, this happened to me again just this week. I was spending some time with, with the Lord, and, and I was reading through John. I got to John 15. And just this phrase, I didn't know I needed it, but Jesus tells his disciples, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And I was like, wow, are you kidding me? That as much as God loves Jesus, Jesus loves me. I didn't know I needed to hear that, but that hit me like a ton of bricks. That just kind of whoop, realigned my heart. God loves me. And what that did was it just made me see the world in a new way. I can go out and love others. And that's what's going to happen with you. That's what's going to happen to you in your life as you make time to sit at his feet. And the second thing I think we need to do in order to keep from being worried and upset about many things this Christmas, number one, we need to sit at the feet of Jesus. Number two, we need to allow worry and stress and anxiety to be those red flags signaling when we're focusing on lesser things. You see, Martha could have allowed that anxiety to say, oh, something is out of alignment in my heart. Several times this week, I've sensed anxiety that then signals to me something is out of alignment in my heart. And so this Christmas season, as you find yourself, ah! ready to break, ready to snap. Feel your heart stressed out, anxiety. Be aware enough to realize what is happening. You are focusing on lesser things. And that's okay, it's human, and there's grace for that. But take a moment to breathe in that moment and realign your heart and become aware again of the presence of Christ who is with you. That he's not only with you, he is for you. He's not only for you, he is, he is in you. And his power can give you perspective to focus on the one thing rather than the lesser things. Can we say this one more time? This Christmas, I will not let the good things distract me from the one thing.